My name is Alan Thaler. I'm in the Division of Endocrinology. Um, I have the great honor this morning to uh, remember John Leonard on the occasion of the John Leonard uh, Memorial Lectureship, and also to have the honor of uh, introducing our uh, lecturer today, Dr. John Bilizikian. Uh, John Lin Leonard, as you see here, was uh, grew up in Minnesota. He attended the St. John's University of Minnesota and then got his MD from the University of Minnesota. He subsequently went to the Harbor UCLA uh, internal medicine program where he was uh, chosen by his peers as both uh, intern of the year and then resident of the year and then migrated to Seattle where he uh, became an endocrine fellow in the tutelage of Dr. Alvin Paulson. This was at the US Public Health Service Hospital uh, back in the day when it was still nationally funded and he actually had a role in the transitioning from a nationally funded hospital to a locally uh, supported uh, public institution. He uh, finished his fellowship, uh, did, had a successful fellowship finished and then spent one year at the University of Iowa as a junior faculty member but the lure of Seattle was too much for him and he returned to Seattle. Uh, initially at the Virginia Mason Center where he was a clinical endocrinologist and he was there for three years. All three years he was chosen as teacher of the year that he was there and then was lured back to the university as a full-time faculty person at the Public Health Service Hospital where he first was chief of endocrinology and shortly thereafter he became chief of the medical service and that was during the time that he guided help guide the transition from the nationally funded to a locally funded uh, public hospital. He was uh, adored by many and considered a great clinician and a great teacher. Um, and unfortunately though, after putting off a, a vacation to Hawaii multiple times, he eventually made there, but while on vacation in Hawaii at the young age of 42, he suffered a fatal myocardial infarction. Uh, and was survived by his wife Virginia and four children between the ages of 12 and 17. As a token kind of or as an example of the high esteem that he was held in by everyone, I'll read to you uh, uh, a quote from his chief medical resident, um, Dr. Uh, Jack Haley, um, when he was at the memorial service. John became the chief of medicine the same year I came to Seattle to start my internship. During the five year period since then, I and many others had the honor of association with him. As I sat home last evening, I tried to overcome the intense feelings of sadness because of John's death. Many of the memories that I have of John during my training seem a little less distinct, almost a little blurred. I think that is because with all my heart, I wish that I could hear his words again and I could watch him work his magic again at the bedside of his patients in the clinics and in the ward. But even if those words and those scenes are not as vivid as I was like, the message that he gave to all of us is still clear and distinct. To give to others with openness and warmth and with laughter and to be the best we can and to practice the art and science of medicine with skill, integrity, and sensitivity. He was the model for many of us and we will miss him but never forget him. So at the time of his death, there were very few teaching awards in the system at that time. And partly in response to this, they created the first uh, house staff uh, elected or chosen Teacher of the Year Award, the Paul Beeson Award, which the first recipient of that was Dr. John Leonard, given to him posthumously in 1985. So with that spirit, since that time, a group of admirers, friends, family, uh, patients, colleagues, uh, made donations to establish this lectureship and as you can see since he died in 1982 it's been going on for quite a while and we've had many great speakers here over the years as with various topics within endocrinology. This year we have the distinct pleasure of having John Bilizikian who is the Dorothy and Daniel Silverberg, Silverberg Professor of Medicine, Professor of uh, Pharmacology at Columbia University College of Physicians and uh, Scientists. Uh, medicine. He um, went to Harvard as an undergraduate. He then went back to, he went to Columbia then as a house staff member at, at, uh, at medical school and house staff member and then went to the NIH where under the tutelage of Dr. Gerald Arbach 
studied uh, bone and mineral metabolism, then returned to Columbia where he's been ever since. He is a professor of medicine there as noted. He was, uh, he's chief emeritus of the division of endocrinology having just finally stepped down from that position one year ago after 29 years as the chief of endocrinology there. He's the director of the Bone Mineral Research Center there. He is uh, the member of many societies. He's been on many editorial boards. He has over 750 authored peer-reviewed papers. He was co-chair of the last three international conferences, uh, workshops on primary hyperparathyroidism, the single uh, international workshop on hypoparathyroidism. His research interests are primarily uh, are related to uh, metabolic bone disease, particularly osteoporosis, primary hyperparathyroidism, and hypoparathyroidism. He's the recipient of the Distinguished Physician Award from the Endocrine Society, the Frederick Barter Award from the American Bone and Mineral Research Society uh, for Excellence in Clinical Research. He also is the Laureate Distinguished Educator Award from the Endocrine Society, uh, many accolades and awards over the years. There really, I don't think we could find anyone more uh, qualified and capable of addressing today's uh, topic, which is osteoporosis 2016 and beyond horizons of therapy. Done. Well, Alan, thank you uh, for those kind of remarks about me, but also for the remembrance. Uh, of John Leonard. I, I never had the pleasure of knowing uh, Dr. Leonard, but in his short life, he obviously had a great impact. And um, it's a lesson for all of us. Um, lives lived well and productively. It doesn't matter how long or short they are. Uh, they can have a great impact on the future generations. So um, this talk is for Dr. Leonard and um, the legacy he left, and hopefully we will be worthy of what he's left us uh, to complete. Uh, in thinking about this uh, lecture today, I, I felt that this audience, a general audience of, of internists, uh, many of you, of course, are specialists. Not all of you are endocrinologists. I would guess few of you are endocrinologists. But this is going to be a talk about osteoporosis, a disorder that everybody needs to know about, uh, whatever uh, our field in medicine is. Uh, what I hope to do is to paint a picture of uh, where we are, uh, what is the landscape of this disease now, and where is this uh, disease going in terms of uh, therapeutics, both in terms of concepts and the application of some of these con uh, concepts into um, uh, ideas of new therapies. <clears throat> to start, uh, it's pretty obvious that osteoporosis is um, a global problem. Uh, and this is a typical slide. Um, uh, it's an old slide, but it still makes the point. Uh, in pink are the projections of the numbers of hip fractures uh, in the year 2050, a uh, 100 years uh, later in yellow. And every part uh, of the world is seeing an increase. Yes, there have been some secular trends that may not support um, the astounding increase that has been projected, but nevertheless, uh, this disease is not going away. Uh, it's a global problem. Uh, it also is a national problem. Again, these are projections uh, from uh, the uh, US uh, suggesting that um, the numbers of individuals with either osteoporosis or a term that we describe as low bone density uh, will be uh, increasing uh, inexorably. Uh, in this uh, country, we see about 2 million uh, fragility fractures yearly. Uh, if you take a typical Caucasian woman at the age of 50, um, she has a pretty high lifetime risk uh, of having one of the three major uh, osteoporotic uh, fracture sites, namely a vertebral fracture, a hip fracture, uh, or a forearm fracture. And in terms of numbers, that figure of 2 million breaks down into a lot of hip fractures, uh, forearm fractures, uh, compression fractures, and not to belittle at all the importance of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer, very important disorders. But in terms of the number of events, certainly there are many more osteoporotic fractures uh, 
uh, than there are events of those other very important diseases. Uh, we are speaking about a disease that has a very high mortality. This is not a disease that just is associated with broken bones. Um, there is a high mortality figure, partly related to the age at which many of uh, patients will sustain their hip fracture, uh, an increased risk of mortality of upwards of 20% uh, in the first year. But also there's disability, there's uh, issues of independence, uh, and about 80% of subjects who sustain a hip fracture are no longer able to carry on at least one independent activity of daily living. There is a human cost of this disease. This is a woman uh, you can see typically um, has the posture of someone who has pretty advanced osteoporosis. Uh, she sits on a park bench. Um, it's easier for her to sit than to walk. And the more she sits, the more uh, she's going to lose bone mass. You can notice that she's not obese. This is one of the disorders that is not associated with obesity. Um, she can't eat very much because those thoracic compression fractures have really compromised her uh, gastric capacity. Also, those thoracic uh, compression fractures will have reduced her vital capacity. So there are pulmonary issues. Uh, there are issues with regard to just being able to sleep as she tries to get comfortable uh, in bed. Uh, she will not live as long uh, as her uh, non-osteoporotic counterparts. Now, those of you who are close might be able to appreciate that this woman uh, appears to have just had her hair done. Uh, I think she's wearing lipstick and she's wearing some kind of a heel. And I point these points out uh, because obviously she's trying to look as well as she uh, can look. But you look at her and she looks at herself in the mirror and she knows she's literally a shadow of her former self. Uh, so this is a disease that robs women and men, don't forget, 25% of osteoporotic fractures in this country occur in men, men and women of their self-esteem. Now, how do we define osteoporosis? Um, some of these pictures actually are thanks to Susan Ott, who's here. Susan has done some of the beautiful histomorphometry of osteoporosis. These pictures come from David Dempster, uh, and they make the point that this is a disorder uh, not just of low bone density, but a disorder characterized by compromised bone strength that leads to an increased risk of fracture. So this is a, a, a scanning micrograph of a normal piece of bone. You can see this beautiful trabecular architecture, this honeycombing that has really great connectivity and good resistance to stress. But the upper panel, again, less bone, but what's left has also a big problem. There's a microarchitectural issue here. The bones that are left are not well put together. They're disordered, they're breaking, uh, and their bone quality um, is uh, markedly uh, compromised. Now, before 1986, um, it wasn't easy to make the diagnosis of osteoporosis short of that uh, compression fracture or that hip fracture. Uh, in 1986, uh, technology became available, and of course you all know what that is, that's DEXA, Dual Energy X-ray Absorptiometry. Um, uh, it has allowed us uh, to find individuals who are at risk or by virtue of what their bone density is, may even have osteoporosis before the osteoporotic fracture occurs. So this DEXA technology uh, has certainly um, found its way into our regular practices. The basis of why we use this surrogate endpoint as a measure of a disease is related to this relationship. And this relationship teaches that for every standard deviation reduction in bone density, there's an approximate doubling in fracture risk. Now, this is a very powerful relationship. There are very few surrogate endpoints in medicine that can be associated so powerfully with an endpoint. Yes, hypertension is a very good example. Blood pressure is correlated very importantly with stroke. Um, cholesterol, not nearly as well co co coordinated uh, with the cardiovascular disease as this relationship. So this has formed a basis 
for our saying that reduced bone density is a measure of fracture risk. And in some studies, reduced bone density has reflected reduced bone strength. And on the basis of this, the World Health Organization in 1994 um, established um, uh, operational criteria by which one could look at the risk of a fracture by virtue of that uh, DEXA test and translate that into a diagnosis. This wasn't actually the intent of the WHO, but it turned out to be the case. And what it said was that if that bone density test was 2.5 standard deviations below the standard young adult who's reached peak bone mass, uh, we would say that that increase in fracture risk is sufficiently great to allow us to make a diagnosis of osteoporosis. So that translates into the T-score. The T-score, if it's less than minus 2.5, uh, is a definition, a diagnosis of osteoporosis. There is this never-never land between a T-score of minus 1 and minus 2.5. It's variously called low bone mass, low bone density. Some people refer to it as osteopenia. We tend to shy away from that term osteopenia. It doesn't really decide, it doesn't tell us the patient has a disease, but I have a lot of patients who come to me and say, doctor, I have a real problem. I have osteopenia as if this is a disease. It may lead to osteoporosis, but it may not. Anyway, there's this, range of minus 1 to minus 2.5 that we sometimes need to pay attention to. And then, of course, those who are lucky enough to have a T-score within one standard deviation of that young, normal, optimal peak bone mass uh, would be uh, said to have normal bone density. So, uh, who needs a bone density test? Very nice question and sort of has been answered with a little bit of evidence. Um, if you look at age, uh, the Medicare bone Mass Measurement Act uh, has entitled all women over the age of 65 to a bone density test. Men, not so clear. Um, there are no entitlements for men in this regard, but most of the big societies are recommending that men also have a bone density test uh, when they reach the age of 70. We have other criteria, such as some people under the ages of 65 or 70 who had a fragility fracture, that is a fall from a standing height without major trauma, that would be enough to make us think of doing a bone density test. Someone who's going to be started on glucocorticoid therapy for a period of time of greater than three months and more than five milligrams worth of prednisone, again, uh, that would be another criterion. And there are more that we will talk about uh, very shortly. But let's just ask a simple question. Among women entitled, to the bone density test by the Bone Mass Measurement Act, how many would you say in this country, over the age of 65, how many women have actually had a bone density test? So I'll give you uh, a few choices. How many say um, 75 to 100% of women who could and should have had a bone density test? Nobody's going to take 75 to 100%. Obviously, this is a rhetorical question. The answer is bad, yeah. 50 to 75 a couple of people, 25 to 50, more and more, okay, and under 25%. All right, so it's a pretty good split. Bad news or bad news? And the answer is bad news. Um, yeah, but less than 40% of women, um, and there are many reasons for this, and we won't go into it, but it really, for us to, we, it, we should put it on our to-do list as far as health surveillance in our patients who have reached the age of 65, it should be done. Now, there are other, I mentioned a few of the other reasons why we would do bone density in the younger individuals. Family history turns out to be extremely important. I mentioned the previous fragility fracture, use of glucocorticoids. Smoking is bad for everything, as you know, and excess alcohol intake is also not good for your bones. And very recently, uh, um, we are recognizing more and more that diabetes mellitus is a risk factor. Uh, bone density doesn't always give us the answer. In fact, often it doesn't give us the answer uh, in these individuals, but nevertheless, uh, it should be done. 
There are non-pharmacological approaches to osteoporosis that we all subscribe to. Exercise, preferably weight-bearing exercise, uh, consistent with a person's capabilities. Um, somebody who has osteoporosis, you're not going to uh, recommend um, starting to do downhill skiing. Uh, avoiding smoking, excessive alcohol intake, and adequate calcium and vitamin D are all part of the non-pharmacological approaches to uh, not only to individuals who have osteoporosis, but to all of us um, who uh, may not have osteoporosis. Uh, there are other things we want to bear in mind. Eyesight, hearing, home safety, assistive ambulatory devices. There's some interest in hip pads, although that hasn't gained a lot of traction recently, uh, but it's not a bad idea. And also to suggest that your patients not engage in risky behavior. <laughs> this is not advised. Okay, so let's move into a discussion of the drugs that we have available. And this is a list of, uh, of drugs, not all of which are available in this country, such as strontium ranolate. Uh, and I've divided them into um, uh, the pluses and uh, little negative signs. Um, the pluses are uh, my view on the evidence for which these drugs either would reduce vertebral, non-vertebral, or hip fracture. Where you see the dashes, it doesn't mean that these drugs don't reduce fractures at these sites, but uh, simply we don't have the evidence, okay? Um, and you'll see that we have a lot of drugs in the top um, part of this slide that get pluses across the board. Obviously, we want drugs that are effective across the board. Um, and then we have other drugs that get a few pluses, but not uh, pluses all over. And I'll, I'll be making comments as we go along. Let me uh, talk about the, bisphos the bisphosphonates briefly. These are the original um, drugs that we uh, have been using since 1995. And we know what these drugs do. They improve bone density by a substantial degree in the lumbar spine and the hip. Uh, we know these bisphosphonates typically reduce the incidence of vertebral fractures anywhere from 40 to 70%. Uh, and most of the bisphosphonates uh, are, uh, has been shown to reduce non-vertebral fractures uh, in women. Uh, there's a little bit about abandronate, uh, where for which the evidence is not ironclad, but some post hoc analyses have shown um, some non vertebral uh, efficacy. Uh, there has been great emphasis on the other side of the coin uh, benefits we know, uh, risks we are aware of. And here are some <clears throat> that have been um, mentioned and, in fact, have uh, received class warnings. Um, there are upper GI issues with the orally available bisphos bisphosphonates. Um, there's a class warning with regard to bone, joint, and muscle pain. Very rare, but it happens. Uh, with intravenous or parenteral bisphosphonates, a uh, acute phase reaction with the flu-like syndrome can occur um, for several days um, after the first dose and rarely after the second dose. Uh, class warnings about osteonecrosis of the jaw and a class warning about atypical fractures of the so subtrope regions of the femur. <clears throat> These last two have received a lot of attention in the press. They are very rare events, but they occur. The problem is that um, they, the fact that they occur, however rarely, has led the media uh, to perceive, and many patients, the following. They cause the stomach to hurt. Doctor, my jaw is going to fall out. They cause fractures, paradoxically. They cause cancer, some weak epidemiological evidence about esophageal cancer. And they're all the same. They're all bad. And I'm sure a lot of your patients say they don't want to go near these bisphosphonates. Uh, now, the problem is that however you view this controversy, perception is very important. Um, people vote. They will not take the drug, however you think they're not quite thinking correctly about it. Um, and there are some individuals, both professional and non-professional, that uh, believe that the bisphosphonates cause more harm than good. 
I think the evidence argues against that. Um, we respect adverse events a lot. We don't want to do harm. But I believe that um, the bisphosphonates, if you look at all the data, cause more good than harm when used appropriately. <laughs> but we can do better. Um, none of these bisphosphonates is perfect. I mentioned the adverse events. Um, there are cost considerations in some cases. And, and because of the great progress that's been made, excuse me, I didn't do anything. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there, uh, there has been uh, an attempt to translate some of the great breakthroughs in bone biology to new therapies for osteoporosis. So let me talk about some of the new things, some of which uh, have actually already been translated into a drug, such as denosumab. Uh, denosumab uh, was born of this um, discovery that there is a cytokine, uh, a product of the osteocyte and perhaps also the osteoblast. The cytokine is called rank ligand. Rank ligand is a very powerful stimulator of the bone resorbing cell, the osteoclast. It is also a very powerful stimulator of the differentiation of pre-osteoclast uh, to the mature osteoclast. Rank ligand is an extremely powerful cytokine, uh, and if there were no way of controlling rank ligand in our bodies, we would all probably be jellyfish. But over the past 400 million years, uh, around that amount of time, um, the body has figured a way of dealing with rank ligand by a, uh, a cognate uh, a decory uh, a molecule called osteoprotogerin, as shown in these green dumbbells. So OPG will tie up rank ligand and prevent it from getting to its cognate receptor on the osteoclast rank, and thereby help to control uh, the effect of rank ligand to resorb bone. So this thinking obviously would lead to, if you're a, a pharmacologist, or in working in a drug company, you would be thinking about making a molecule like OPG. And in fact, OPG was made, but didn't turn out to be a safe therapeutic. But a drug was developed, a IgG antibody to rank ligand that is known as denosumab. And denosumab in the Y configuration is like OPG. It is given uh, as a subcutaneous injection once every six months. And as a good antibody, it circulates in the blood for about six months. That's the way the dose works. And over this six-month period, it works like a Pac-Man. It seeks and destroys uh, whatever rank ligand might have gotten into the circulation. It is a very, very powerful drug. It really wipes out rank ligand. And there is very little bone resorption uh, by virtue of what denosumab does. The FREEDOM trial uh, led to the approval of denosumab. Uh, this was published in the New England Journal about seven years ago. Very well-designed, placebo-controlled study of the dose that is now available, 60 milligrams. Um, uh, the primary endpoint being uh, new vertebral fractures by x-ray over three years, and secondary endpoints of non-vertebral fractures and hip fractures. As you can see here, the endpoints uh, were met. The primary endpoint, a significant reduction in relative risk of new vertebral fractures, and also the secondary endpoints, non vertebral fractures and hip fractures, were also significantly reduced. Now, this is old data. There are much more recent data um, presented um, at the ASBMR meetings over the past couple of years. Um, the initial trial, this Freedom trial, has been extended in open label form now for 10 years, uh, the placebo group crossed over to drug, so we don't have a placebo uh, uh, control anymore. But we do have longitudinal data with denosumab that now is out to 10 years. Here are the eight-year data showing very interestingly uh, that the group that got denosumab initially um, continues over the next five years to accrue bone density in the hip. This is also true, in fact, more dramatically uh, in the lumbar spine. This is the placebo group that gets crossed over uh, to DMAB, and you see it picks up 
this with a similar slope of increase as did the group that got drug at the first uh, time. Uh, the uh, issue of long-term effects, these are the non-vertebral fractures, uh, uncontrolled and the statistics are not clear, but it does seem like over time in the blue bars, the incidence of non-vertebral fractures is trending downward as the drug is used for a longer period of time. And that continued increase in bone density and that sense of non-vertebral fractures uh, progressively becoming a less does argue for the relationship uh, between improving bone density and reducing fracture. It's a very uh, uncertain relationship and certainly not uh, super tight, but it nevertheless provides some evidence that bone density might help as it goes up to give you an idea that um, a fracture risk is a falling. So this notion of bone density dropping, fracture risk increasing, could be balanced perhaps by this hysteretic relationship as bone density increases, fracture risk declines. So in general, the data with denosumab seems to be a little bit more secure than the relationship between bone density and fracture risk that we know of for the bisphosphonates. Now here are the 10-year data. And now I show you the lumbar spine. It's really quite amazing. Um, this is now 10 years later. Bone density has improved by 21.7%. And the total hip is improved by about 9%. So if you translate that into T-scores, roughly, that's like improving two units, two T-score units in the lumbar spine and one T-score unit in the uh, total hip. Uh, it is not clear what can account for this rather unprecedented relentless increase in bone density over a 10-year period. We don't know of any other drug that is able to uh, show this uh, long-term effect. And it may have something to do with an action of drug permitting uh, bone modeling to occur at certain surfaces of bone. Modeling is a term that we usually reserve for, for children. The growing skeleton accrues bone on quiescence surfaces. Adults are not thought to model. We tend to remodel surfaces that have already been resorbed. But here's some evidence that was just published by David Dempster and Mike Mogominski that suggests that by certain labeling approaches that there might be accrual of bone on quiescent surfaces. Not clear at all, but again, a suggestive point as to how this might allow for understanding the continued increase in bone density. Let me move on to another um, agent, not available, um, but it ba it's based upon uh, another new concept in bone biology. Um, this has to do with osteoclast activity. Uh, there is an enzyme called cathepsin K. <clears throat> cathepsin K is a very powerful protease that is released into, these, uh, into the uh, matrix of bone and helps to uh, resorb the organic uh, phase so as to create this resorption pit that will ultimately be re, uh, replaced by new collagen and uh, new bone mineral. Uh, Cadepsin K uh, is related to a disease called pycnodysostosis, uh, a genetic disease of Cadepsin K absence in which bone is not being resorbed. And the famous artist Toulouse Lautrec is thought maybe to have had this disease. There are certain uh, genetic manipulations that have shown that if you knock out cathepsin K, you will have an osteopetrotic state, uh, or uh, alternatively, if you overexpress cathepsin K, uh, as you would expect, you have a high turnover state uh, and bone loss. Uh, there, therefore, uh, there have been some studies with a cathepsin K inhibitor. This drug has a name, odanacatib. Um, there are phase two and there are phase three data now. This was from the phase two trial that Mike McClung published a few years ago. A dosing study looking at bone density after 18 to 24 months. And you can see here over a five year period at the lumbar spine and at the femoral neck, there's a pretty impressive increase in the 50 milligram once a week oral dose of odanacatib. Odanacatib is an anti-resorber as is the nosumab, as is the bisphosphonate. But odanacatib seems to work a little bit differently. 
Yes, it re re uh, shows a reduction in bone resorption. These are markers, urinary NTX, serum CTX, <clears throat> and sort of in a dose ranging fashion, not completely. This drug does reduce bone resorption, at least using bone markers, and obviously there's histomorphometric evidence as well. Now, different from the other drugs we've talked about so far, um, if you look at markers of bone formation, these drugs seem to work in sync. They reduce bone resorption and they reduce bone formation. They don't reduce bone formation to the same extent as they reduce bone resorption, so they alter the balance. But here with odanacatib, um, even only at the highest dose, you see a rather small effect on these circulating markers of bone formation. And it's quite different from alendronate and denosumab, where, as I mentioned, there's a really pretty important effect on bone formation uh, as well as bone resorption. But with odanacatib, it seems like there's a much smaller effect uh, uh, on bone formation, thus suggesting a greater permissive action uh, in the face of this drug uh, to have bone formation activity. And this has been translated into a thought that since this drug only affects one function of the osteoclast, namely the pepsin K, it doesn't kill the osteoclast the way the bisphosphonates may. Um, they don't disappear the way they disappear with denosumab. They're there in abundance. In fact, their osteoclasts are in overabundance in the uh, presence of odanacatib. So there may be signaling molecules that are still able to talk to the osteoblast and keep the osteoplast uh, active. At least that's uh, a thought. <clears throat> the uh, phase three trial um, uh, we know about, we have data with regard to efficacy and safety, and I'll briefly summarize that for you. Uh, the primary endpoint of this phase three trial, again, like all these trials, new morphometric vertebral fractures, but they also had hip and non-vertebral fractures as a primary endpoint. Uh, and uh, uh, this is just a description of the study. These people had osteoporosis either by T-score or by a previous uh, radiographic fracture. You can see a huge study, 16,000 uh, people, almost 400 centers, 40 countries, a big, big study. And the results showed um, that the endpoints were met. Uh, significant reduction in new and worsening morphometric vertebral fractures, significant reductions in clinical hip fractures, uh, reductions in clinical non-vert fractures, and uh, major reductions in clinical vertebral fractures. So this is all great, but now we have to worry about the safety issues. Uh, there were morphia-like lesions seen in a in a, a unbalanced number of subjects, a small number. Uh, these morphia-like uh, skin lesions did not have systemic uh, uh, concomitants, and they seemed to resolve uh, when the drug stopped. There also were, curiously, five examples of atypical femoral shaft fractures. In this sh rather short-term study in the odanacatib group, uh, and there were no atypical fractures in the uh, placebo group. And um, of even greater concern, and this is highlighted in this slide, there were numerical imbalances of drug versus placebo in a number of cardiovascular endpoints, uh, particularly fatalities after stroke. Uh, <clears throat> it is not still clear what this means. Um, what is known is that a lot of these subjects were lost to follow, they dropped out, and um, the FDA has permitted um, a company to undergo a re-adjudication uh, to find all the studies as cohorts uh, of these 40 uh, countries and uh, to have this uh, uh, proceed. And to my knowledge, this is still proceeding. So four years after the phase three data were, be, became available, we still don't uh, have any more information about this. Uh, the drug has not been submitted to the FDA for review yet. <clears throat> Now, let me move on to another area, uh, and this has to do with uh, some of our goals. And I mentioned before, what we would really like to do is not just to damp down bone loss, but to stimulate bone gain. And this is kind of the idea. <clears throat> you can take a broken down piece of bone and convert it uh, to one that's less uh, evolved and 
for those of you who still dare to dream, is it possible to completely reconstruct the skeleton? That's kind of like the Holy Grail. Maybe we can. And if we are going to, we really do have to move into the osteoanabolic discussion. <clears throat> what are the agents that actually limit, literally directly stimulate bone growth? You all know about teriparatide, that's been around since 2002, but I don't want to talk, I don't want to talk about teriparatide directly now, but I want to talk about a new kid on the block. This is a um, invented molecule. It's a analog of PTHRP, not PTH. Uh, PTHRP is a molecule that was discovered in the context of hypercalcemia of malignancy. <clears throat> Here is teriparatide in schematic fashion. PTHRP is like PTH um, in some ways, the green homologous areas, but in many ways in the white it isn't. This drug that has a name, abaloparatide, is very similar to PTHRP, but when you get to the C-terminal portion of the amino terminal part of PTHRP in yellow are new uh, cassettes of residues that have been inserted into the linear sequence of PTHRP so as to maximize its anabolic effect uh, and to minimize its resorptive effect. So this is the kind of the idea, the drug abaloparatide in a head-to-head -head early study uh, looking at the 80 microgram dose, four times the dose of teriparatide, over 12 months, this is the blue, uh, showed a much greater uh, increase in bone density than did the comparable 20 microgram dose of teriparatide. <clears throat> the phase three trial for abaloparatide was ended in September 2014. The results became available um, a year plus ago. And uh, Paul Miller presented some of the early data uh, at the Endocrine Society meetings in March of last year and just a few weeks ago uh, in Boston. <clears throat> the design of the study, uh, placebo and abaloparatide blinded uh, together, but this uh, comparator, teriparatide, was an open-label comparator. Uh, and the data show that with regard to uh, changes in bone markers, this is a resorption marker, this is a bone formation marker, you can see that teriparatide stimulates bone resorption by this marker uh, and also bone formation. Uh, if you look at abaloparatide, there is a more close uh, relationship uh, between the two peptides in terms of bone formation, but uh, abaloparatide seems to stimulate bone resorption to a lesser extent. In terms of bone density, both um, agents seem to stimulate lumbar spine bone density to the same degree. Um, uh, and also in terms of reducing the incidence of new vertebral fractures, uh, both abaloparatide and teriparatide seem to be analogous. Uh, this is also true with regard to hip sites, total hip density and femoral neck bone density, although abaloparatide might be given the edge in terms of increasing bone density a little bit earlier than does teriparatide. But in looking at non-vertebral fractures or clinical fractures, the reduction uh, in relative risk is similar between abaloparatide and teriparatide. What might be different is the time of onset. This is subject to um, careful statistical analysis that has not yet been done, <coughs> uh, but it does appear that maybe abaloparatide is differentiating itself earlier from placebo and from teriparatide uh, very early on um, with regard to new vertebral fractures and also with regard to uh, reducing uh, clinical fractures earlier than uh, does teriparatide. <clears throat> also interestingly, uh, there is a major increase in bone density of the ultradistal radius, which is very unusual for teriparatide. Teriparatide usually reduces bone density in the distal uh, regions of the forearm. And also, interestingly, there's a reduction in wrist fractures, much more so with abaloparatide than with teriparatide. With all of these osteoanabolic agents, we do have to deal with rat data that suggests that, uh, not suggest, that clearly show that if you treat rats um, uh, with uh, teriparatide or with abaloparatide or with PTHRP, there is no question that you will stimulate the production or the development 
of osteosarcoma. Um, and that is clear. What is not clear is whether that rat experience has any relationship uh, to the human experience. There are reasons to believe that there is no relationship, and now, uh, 14 years later, we have seen no signals that would suggest that the short-term use of teriparatide and even PTH184 has been associated with any, with any increase in osteosarcoma. In fact, such as we have, uh, there may be even a smaller number of subjects that have this. So it is a black box drug, teriparatide. Uh, abaloperatide, by the way, has been submitted for review to the FDA just as of three weeks ago. What about combination therapy? Um, I'm only going to talk about one, the newest, because the others I have been, uh, I should say, underwhelmed by using anti-resorptives and, you know, you name it, they're all here uh, with uh, teriparatide. <laughs> but the combination of denosumab uh, and um, teriparatide has a real interest for me because it seems to be based on a pretty interesting hypothesis, and that is understanding and appreciating that parathyroid hormone has two basic biochemical pathways. It has a catabolic pathway that can be very bad for bones in which it needs rank ligand. It also has an anti-sclerostin anabolic pathway. And this balance may have to do with how PTH is presented to bone, either as a continuous fashion, in which case it might be catabolic, as in hyperparathyroidism, or it might be anabolic in the case of a single pulse, as we do for uh, teriparatide. Now, with denosumab, as you now know, it being an anti-rank ligand agent, it might prevent parathyroid hormone, or teriparatide, from going down that pathway. And thus, in the presence of denosumab, exogenous parathyroid hormone might be shifted into the anabolic pathway by inhibiting sclerostin and allowing the wind signaling pathway to move forward. Okay, so there's some interesting data from Ben Leader's lab in Boston suggesting that combination of teriparatide and denosumab um, will increase bone density at the spine and at the hip to a greater extent than monotherapy with denosumab or teriparatide alone. And Joy Tsai in Ben's group has looked at HRPQCT, which is a non-invasive, high-resolution imaging approach, and has shown that certain um, uh, parameters of trabecular bone and cortical bone, both at the tibia and the radius, are uh, to, uh, shown to a greater extent with combination therapy than with monotherapy. Remember, however, that with combination therapy, any of these combinations, we don't have really good data except for some bone density, bone marker data, no long-term data, no information about microstructure except for what I just showed you, and there are no fracture data. So I'm not all that wild about combination therapy. You, it's, you add to expense, you add to the potential of adverse events. All right, in the last few minutes, um, what is the future of this field? I want to point out another pathway I've sort of alluded to, uh, the sclerostin pathway. There are two diseases of sclerostin deficiency, sclerostiosis and then Bookham's disease. These are extremely rare diseases in which uh, a portion of the sclerostin gene is uh, missing or there's a single point mutation. And the inhibitor of uh, 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 the loss of sclerostin leads to very high bone mass syndrome. And it can be associated with some complications. But we also know that there are heterozygous carriers of Van Bulkham's disease and sclerostiosis in which, yes, they have high bone density, they accrue bone, uh, they don't get into trouble with too much bone mass, and they never fracture. So let me go back briefly and review this new pathway. This is the WINT signaling pathway shown here. Here are some of the players. There's WINT, there are lots of WINTs, but there's one particular one for bone. Um, sclerosin, there's DKK1, and there are all kinds of other factors here. WINT engages with LRP5 and 6, and what it does ultimately is to allow for the translocation 
uh, beta catenin, a very powerful transcription factor, uh, into the nucleus where anabolic pathways are stimulated. Now again, as in the case with rank ligand, if you had unlimited wind signaling, we would accrue bone forever and probably not survive. So the body has figured a way of dealing with this, and that is by using inhibitors of wind, one of which is chlorostin. Chlorostin interposes itself by binding to LRP56 and preventing WINT from engaging and preventing, therefore, beta-catenin to get into the nucleus. So with this interesting information, it didn't take long to figure out an anti-sclerostin antibody that would tie up sclerostin, just like denosumab ties up rank ligand, and thereby permitting WINT to have freer access to its pathway and allowing beta-catenin and the anabolic pathway to go forward. So there's a lot of animal data, I'm going to go briefly because I'm running out of time, that shows that this anti-sclerostin antibody is extremely powerful as a bone formation agent at many surfaces, periosteal, endocortical, and looking at even within the cortical and endocortical and intracortical surfaces, the green shows you this powerful anabolic effect. Note, however, and interestingly, there is no seemingly effect to affect osteoplast activity. In fact, it seems to be damped. And there is some evidence from Michael Minsky suggesting that the surfaces of bone are so covered by bone formation activity that this may another, be another example of how an agent is stimulating bone modeling in the adult skeleton. So we have a drug called romasosumab. I'm only going to mention romasosumab. Uh, we have data on the phase two trial, it's typical phase two trial dosing, looking at this parenterally administered anti-sclerostin agent, showing a very profound stimulation of bone density at the lumbar spine, the total hip, um, and over a two-year period, even further increases uh, using romasosumab at 210 milligrams injection every month. Now, as of February 22nd, there is a press release. This is the first data we have on the phase two clinical trial. The phase two clinical trial was a one-year trial of romasosumab, followed by one year of denosumab. And the endpoints were one year and two year endpoints, which is a really remarkable uh, attempt. Uh, after 12 and 24 months, the endpoints were effects on vertebral fractures, and the secondary endpoints at 12 and 24 months were non-vertebral fractures. And this is the interesting data, 73% uh, reduction of vertebral fractures uh, at 12 months and a 75% on the transition to DMAB. But in terms of the secondary endpoints, there was no significant reduction in non-vertebral fractures at 12 months or at 24 months. Okay. So where are we in this field? Um, this is a quick summary. We've talked about the anti-remodeling agents, the bisphosphonates, the rank ligand inhibitor, where you have a profound reduction in bone resorption and to a lesser extent, a reduction in bone formation, but uh, altering the balance, if you will, uh, in favor of bone formation. Uh, we have this new anti-resorption uh, class, the Cathepsin K inhibitors in which uh, there is even a further shift, if you will, allowing bone formation to proceed, perhaps to a greater degree than we have with the uh, bisphosphonates and the rank ligand inhibitor. We have PTH uh, and the analogs that are stimulating bone formation to a greater extent than they're stimulating bone resorption. And now we have um, another osteoanabolic class, the uh, sclerostin inhibitors, that uh, seem to stimulate rather profoundly bone formation with not much of a change or maybe a slight reduction in uh, the bone resorption. So here's my crystal ball looked at from another point of view. Um, here are the drugs that we have available uh, either here or worldwide now. And what I would project over the next five years, we're going to see a change in this landscape. We're going to um, no longer see strontium or calcitonin and on the surface will appear cathepsin K inhibitors as a new class of anti-resorptives. That PTHRP analog, I would predict, is going to become available, and perhaps also the anti-sclerostin molecule. So what this means for us 
clinicians is that we have an increasingly wide spectrum of drugs to choose in our patients who are appropriate for therapy. And as we move into the era of precision medicine and tailoring drugs uh, to the disease and the nuances of the disease as it may present in an individual, there's going to be a much more, a much greater thought in terms of our field, in terms of these drugs and which ones are better for a given patient. So let me leave you with my last crystal ball and suggest that in our field, I believe that the future is really very bright. And again, let me thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you this morning.